All right, we have more good stuff. So uh, coming up next, we have Christian Twist, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Core Competence, and he's going to speak on big data and uh, the dynamic customer experience, and he's going to answer the question that you had um, uh, pertaining to this in the international space. So come on up, Christian. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. Give it up, for Christian. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great, and here's your box. Perfect. Perfect. First, uh, GDPR. Um, technically speaking, Facebook controls the platform, so the informed consent and the right to forget should apply to that platform. However, there is a scenario where you take copies or otherwise remove the data from Facebook, at which point it would apply to you. So you would need to know that you would need to have a mechanism for the right to forget if you were to do that. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining me today. I really appreciate your time and the warm reception. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. My name is Christian. I'm going to be talking about how to connect key business insights with the experience your customers demand, intelligent analytics and agile customer journeys. I do have a record number of slides for a 40 minute presentation, so we're going to start very quickly, and we are going to begin in the past. Where better to begin than with a quote from the father of the computer? How many of you are familiar with Charles Babbage? You might remember him from high school math class? You can't say it much more clearly than he does. Data helps inform decisions, and the need to acquire meaningful data is nothing new. If you haven't heard of Charles Babbage, you should definitely look him up. He's credited with a number of innovations that make the modern world possible. Interestingly, for our purposes, his mechanical computer was inspired by persistent issues with the mathematical data available at the time. Back then, mathematicians relied on tables, literally long lists of figures that were calculated entirely by hand. These tables were subject to errors both in the original calculations and in the transcription. Babbage realized that there had to be a better way, and the quest for a universal computing device began. While we've come a long way since then, we still face some of the same questions. How do I know if my data is accurate? What do I do to make my data more meaningful? We've developed platforms to capture more and more data that we can use to automate key tasks in the customer experience, but the process hasn't been without challenges. We believe these challenges indicate the need for a new approach to connect business intelligence with the customer experience. After we agree on our approach, what is it we're actually trying to accomplish? What are the key insights I need and how do they impact our customer's experience? The era of customer experience began 20 years ago when Harvard Business Review published Welcome to the Experience Economy. As price and differentiation increase, organizations move to, from providing basic commodities to staging experiences. In one sense, this was nothing new. Consumers have always paid a premium for a high-end brand, be it a Ritz-Carlton or a Mercedes-Benz. And those brands have always prided themselves on delivering a superior experience. What was new, however, was how this trend would affect nearly every sector of the economy, from buying a computer to buying a cup of coffee. The better the experience, the more custom consumers are willing to spend up to 2.4 times as much. Over the past 20 years, this need to improve the experience has given rise to two related but distinct technology trends. Business intelligence provides the data and the insights Marketing automation drives the consumer experience by delivering personalized and targeted journeys. Together, they empower marketers to enhance every interaction with the customer, creating a virtuous feedback loop where data output for business intelligence is used as input for the customer journey. Data captured during the journey is then consumed by the BI, increasing accuracy and improving results over time. The results can be significant. Almost 90% say BI helped them make better business decisions, 70% cited an improvement in customer satisfaction, and well over half claimed it reduced costs and increased revenue at the same time. This shouldn't be surprising to us when BI can power customer journeys that net a 54% greater return on marketing investment, 56% more cross-sell and upsell revenue, and 3.5 times greater referral revenue. 
Unfortunately, the picture is not uniformly positive. This same study by the Aberdeen Group identified the huge challenge we're going to talk about today. Less than 40% of organizations have a methodology to assess their customer journey. We'll get into why that might be the case shortly. Before that, we want to start with a few very basic definitions. First, we're going to define a journey in four key steps. The particulars are going to vary quite a bit from organization to organization. You might have many journeys running at once. These journeys might intersect with one another, but the general form is likely to be a marketing campaign that drives users to a website or some kind of portal, encourages an interaction, and then sends an automated follow-up. It seems very simple, but it's still information rich, and I think it should be pretty easy for everyone, technical and non-technical, to align around. Likewise, we want to do the same thing for business intelligence. Cut through the complicated algorithms and complex machine learning models and focus on what we're ultimately trying to achieve. It should be noted that BI can have much broader implications than customer journeys. There are metrics can help that can help with things like operational and staffing efficiency, analysis of manufacturing processes, etc. But for our purpose today, we really want to narrow the focus to what BI can tell us about our customers, what they're worth, how they find us, who to target, what to spend, where to improve our marketing. We also want to explain how the analysis of your historical data enables us to peek into the future, but we're going to have to overcome those key challenges I mentioned first. If it's been the era of customer experience for 20 years, why are organizations still struggling to reap the rewards? Steve Jobs once said, you've got to start with the customer experience and then work backwards to the technology. But that's not the approach most organizations take when it comes to BI and customer journeys. What we're calling the traditional approach today normally starts with a very laudable goal. The precise definition, integrated data, the point systems, mapping interactions, varies a bit from organization to organization, but the end result is invariably a lot of questions and two key problems. The first is primarily technical. Ignoring Steve, ignoring Steve Jobs' advice and working from the systems app. That is, picking platforms and features before we fully define our outcomes. The second related issue is strategic. Trying to understand too much about the consumer behavior at once and without the right framework. Relying on flat data for a journey that's actually three-dimensional. First, the systems. There are over 3,700 in the market. You can see the little icons there many of which do a lot of the same things, none of which do everything, some of which work well together, and some of which do not. The leaders in the space, Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics, for example, have dozens of modules, modules and features that can take years for an organization to fully implement. There's also a good chance that no single department in your organization owns all of these systems, leading to a lack of alignment between your teams and an inability for you to control the entire process. Control of the process is extremely important. You're never going to reach the end of this long roadmap if your teams aren't fully aligned, and that's assuming these projects are ever really done in the first place. The truth is, the truth is they aren't. It's a classic arms race. You need to keep pace with the competition, keep feeding data into your BI engine, and keep improving your customer experiences pretty much forever, or at least until some new technology company comes out that promises to do it all for you. Whatever the software companies promise, however, one platform to rule them all is highly unlikely. Your data comes from different sources, your customers from different channels, and the sum total of their interactions can be incredibly difficult to unravel. Nor does it help that your data tends to grow exponentially over time. And if your business is thriving, hopefully your customers do too. This leads us to three simple assumptions about the situation. First, you probably have a lot more data on hand, data you've never even seen or touched. For example, how many of you have actually clicked through every screen in Google Analytics? That's just your website data. You probably have a lot of different platforms in play as well. Your ERP, CRM, CMS, maybe a MailChimp, a couple of online advertising systems as well. One of the panels up front mentioned a whole bunch of platforms that they use. Your customers probably find you in a lot of different ways and choose you for a lot of different reasons. Maybe you're in retail and sell your products through a few different channels, some of which are like Amazon that only give you partial data on your customers. The assumptions may be simple, but the outcomes are complex enough to make it feel something like this. Hours are spent, 
dollars are invested, but you're not even sure how much time or money it's gonna to take to finish the project. And then one of your team members comes in and tells you that you're missing a critical data source or that your platform of choice needs a significant customization to accomplish your goals. There's gotta be a better way. We call this better way the agile approach and we seek to answer one key question at a time. Leave the additional questions for later and focus on the most critical insights first. To do that, you're gonna to have to reverse your thinking, refine your objective, and iterate to innovate. innovate. Agile development methodologies such as Scrum all use what's known as the time box model. Instead of deciding what you wanna do and then building a plan that could take six months, a year, two years, three years, or more, identify the time in advance and then the tasks that fit into that time horizon. Leave anything that doesn't fit for the next cycle and just keep moving forward with new cycles. You'll be forced to think differently if you only have so much time to work with. Your objectives are gonna to have to be discrete and you'll be deploying regular iterations. Reverse thinking is a brainstorming technique used in fields as varied as engineering and creative writing. The usual approach is to reimagine the question in its opposite form. From an agile perspective, this means focusing on the outcomes first. What does my program achieve instead of everything it might possibly include? What data do I have that is usable at this point in time, and what additional data can I collect as part of the program? Instead of evaluating systems from front to back, how can I focus on the functionality that's necessary to ultimately achieve my objective? The objective itself should also be refined, specific, and discrete, one question at a time. In the software industry, they refer to this as a minimally viable product, an MVP. For example, Google Maps, Google Maps didn't start as an app. The original iPhone didn't let you purchase songs, much less integrate with the Apple Watch. This functionality was built up over time using an upgrade with incremental improvements. For our purposes, this means instead of the original laudable goal, ask yourself something like, what do I need to acquire new high value customers? Of course, of course we're not gonna stop there. A key part of Agile is the regular release schedule. Whether you refer to them as epics, sprints, or just ongoing enhancements, you need to continuously improve. This approach has been adopted by all of the major tech companies it's going to remain unclear. The goal of a CLTV model is to identify revenue and profit for each new customer in a specific segment or channel. There are two stages to the process. First, an analysis of your transactional data. This analysis looks at three important data points, how recently customers have purchased, how frequently they purchase, and the value of those purchases. This data is used to group customers into segments. For example, you might be a retail organization that sells both B2B and B2C, and channels. For example, the same organization might sell through their own website or Amazon, as I mentioned earlier. These segments are not the same as your marketing personas or other assumptions. They're purely mathematical constructs that are driven by the data, and you're probably gonna be surprised by what you learn if you perform this analysis. Once the segments are finalized, the data is processed by an algorithm, similar to that gobbledygook on the bottom there, and the CLTV is calculated. This has four immediate impacts on your organization beyond any of the longer term benefits. You can shift your marketing spend and channels to target the highest value customers more closely. We say shift because the first round data is likely to be preliminary and companies generally need a broad mix of customers to thrive. The shift should be measurable, however, and allow you to adjust the accuracy of your model while you keep improving your data. You can also improve your online presence immediately for these customers. For example, adding a conversion form with an automated follow-up to see if a few targeted emails in a series increases your conversion rate. Likewise, experiment with a simple retention campaign for existing customers that haven't purchased from you in a while. You should also add the CLT values to your marketing reports, projections, and budgets to compare changes and increase the accuracy over time. Sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state of the previous event. These changes can be used to model anything that conforms to those criteria, even what you plan to do on a rainy or sunny day, as you can see on the right. You can also represent the same data using a heat map, 
factors uh, using a heat map showing the high probability and low probability conversions. Clustering and bar chart versions are also popular. These tools help you find out what's hot and what's not so you can align your website presence with your marketing goals. You should be warned that the output of this kind of analysis is going to be very complex, potentially overwhelming. Unlike the CLTV, there aren't going to be many immediately obvious conclusions. You're ultimately looking at a detailed map of how customers interact with your brand. Your website may have hundreds of pages. You may have thousands of visitors. This map also includes the probability and therefore the ability to predict their next likely action, allowing you to run scenarios to determine what's going to happen if you add another 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 visitors. But what to do with so much data? We recommend following a spin on the law of thirds. Pick three high performing and three low performing conversion funnels, adjust them accordingly, and rerun the data to measure the improvements. We also recommend including a simple three to four step email campaign in there as well, something to keep building out that customer journey and your automated engagement to measure the impact. The next step is to measure a customer's propensity to be persuaded by your marketing efforts. This slide is definitely a bit more simplified than the others. The preliminary analysis on your marketing and SEM spend is a detailed report on its own, especially if you do a lot of advertising. We've glossed over that a little to focus on how this type of uplift modeling segments your customers into groups, the lost causes and those that are unlikely to purchase from you again regardless of the offer, the short things, those that are likely to purchase again under any circumstances, and the two more sensitive types. The do not disturbs will purchase on their own time and are best left marketed to very limitedly. And the persuadables, the audience that is really ready for a nudge. Once your current data is analyzed, you can apply a machine learning model, such as Random Forest or K Nearest Neighborhood, to predict the behavior of future customers and then ultimately target high potential segments for your acquisition. How you market to this persuadable audience is going to vary, but it is helpful to consider the overall space of automated opportunities as we enter the final stretch of this session. Your marketing automation platform, be it Salesforce or another, probably supports a broad range of options. Some of them could be time dependent, like we haven't heard from you in a while, it might be time to reorder. Some of them could be interaction based campaigns that are triggered by specific behaviors, such as products a customer has viewed. You're also likely to have options that incorporate fully automated campaigns, some of which might even leverage AI to determine what and when to send. At the same time, never lose sight of the need for personal interactions. These systems can also be used to alert your sales team to make a phone call. Sometimes the old fashioned method triggered by the latest trends is the most likely to get results. You might have noticed that we've only referenced artificial intelligence and machine learning sparingly up until this point. We've spoken a lot about predictability and modeling, topics that touch on AI, but we haven't directly addressed, addressed where smart software fits in. This is intentional for two reasons. First, the AI algorithms can't operate unless you have the necessary data. They can't look for patterns in your CLTV, for example, unless the data is properly organized and normalized. Second, the current incarnations of this technology are far more assistative than foundational. They're tools that spot a hot lead because they match the profile of a similar customer or identify a trend line in the data that might be too subtle for human eyes. Similar to consumer electronics like Alexa, you might ask her to play a song, but you're unlikely to turn over your retirement planning to her anytime soon. If we return to our original mission to connect business intelligence to the customer experience, you're going to have accomplished quite a bit in that regard, even after doing such a preliminary plan. We have the tools to target and retain high value customers, our model for how they will behave in the future, and the learnings to craft new click streams. Combine that with predicting what customers and prospects were most likely to influence, and we have a framework across the key outreach aspects of your entire organization. If you've used the Agile model, we'll also have demonstrated value each step along the way, making improvements with real results while we build out future initiatives. 
It does bear repeating that you should assume future initiatives are a given. At a minimum, you'll be rerunning the data on a regular basis, tweaking your models, and making continuous improvements. This feedback loop is going to have two very positive effects. First, it's likely to generate more revenue and return on marketing investment as more targeted, personalized campaigns yield increasingly better results. Second, it will generate a lot more refined and accurate data, making your predictions more precise over time and your future marketing even more impactful. If you keep iterating and innovating, the results will come and ultimately deliver on the promise of BI and customer journeys that we shared at the start of the session. Just be sure to tell your CEO that you learned it all at Digimarcon East and they might register through the conference themselves next year. In the meantime, just a few closing thoughts. First, I mentioned that the journey never ends. There is always more to do. On the left, we've listed out a few more, intent, a few more potential business intelligence opportunities for your roadmap. All of these are likely to be very high value as you dig deeper into the data underpinning your organization. While the customer journey side of things is going to be much more specific to your unique business model, hopefully you now have the tools to start experimenting and building out more complex journeys over time. Don't be afraid to be bold. You can always tweak it in the next iteration. We've covered a lot of ground today across 40 slides, but I hope each of you has learned at least one thing you can take back to the office that is gonna have an immediate impact. After all, that's the most important thing. We could talk about considerable benefits, common challenges, how a new approach could potentially break through those barriers. We could even outline a specific framework and plan that should work for a wide variety of organizations, including yours. But the real meaning is going to come from how you impact your customers, and hopefully this session has helped in that regard. I'll leave you with one final thought, very similar to where we started. Of course, we're not all Sherlock Holmes, and sometimes we're going to have to guess. But if you undertake some of these initiatives, you can be confident that you can gather the necessary data to avoid making any capital mistakes. At the very least, you should be able to identify and correct them swiftly, never twisting the facts to suit your theories, for that rarely works in marketing, technology, and life in general, unless, of course, you're a politician. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for the entire team at Digital Markdown for the opportunity.